Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Change Food Eats. I'm Diane Hatz. I'm your host for today, and I'm very excited about our guest, Sanjay Rawal. So Sanjay is a director and producer known for Food Chains, a film about tomato pickers in Florida. His upcoming film, Gather, is about Native American food sovereignty and was made under the guidance of one of the most vaunted NGOs in the Indian country, the First Nations Development Institute. Sanjay is an advocate for equality and works to develop a wide variety of strategies to help nations improve the quality of life for marginalized workers. He works tirelessly to educate audience about philanthropic topics all over the world. Welcome, Sanjay. Diane, it's great to be on your channel. Oh, it's so great to see you. I just want to see if we can, there we go, get rid of Brendan, our tech guy. So how have you been? Especially during these COVID times, crazy days, isn't it? I mean, I'm, I'm based in Queens. And oh, I didn't know that. I'm in the East Village. Oh, so uh, we, we both live pretty close to hospitals. Yeah. And it was just, uh, it's, it was just haunting, the silence of the streets and the, the whirs of the ambulance sirens. But as most folks might know, New York City is kind of the safest place to be in the U.S. right now. Right. Right. I have to say March, April, and May, I didn't do, I wasn't doing too well because I'm on First Avenue mm. and all the hospitals are up on First Avenue. So the sirens were just, and I'm in the back of the building and I could hear them all day. So yeah, so, um, but you're okay, you're healthy. Yeah, and yeah, my parents are in the Bay Area. And they've managed to pretty much be uh, self-sufficient and self-isolated since that time. So. Oh, good. Oh, good, good, good. So, okay, so to start, are you eating anything today? Yeah, I have. It's, it's very noisy, so forgive me. <laughs> um, but my favorite combination, and it gives me a lot of flexibility, is cheese on carbs. I am so with you on that. So it could be nachos, it could be pizza, it could be baked pasta. Today, I've got some bread alone uh, brand San Francisco sourdough, where I'm from, with Havarti cheese and pickled jalapenos. Oh, yeah. So I just had, I had some toast because I have found doing these eating toast is actually not good to do on camera when you're interviewing people. But I just had bread alone. I get the nine grain. I love it. I love the bread. Um, I have, I can't really show it. I have farmer's market surprise with olive oil and panko breadcrumbs and some Parmesan that they throw in the oven. And it's like a it's a vegetable gratin, apparently. Um, and we'll see how much I get to it. So I've learned I have to eat a little before the show or I'll be starving because I can't eat much. Okay, so before we get started, I'm asking every guest this question. How can we create a food system where everyone can eat healthy food? Wow. I mean, my, my film, Gather, focuses on Native American food sovereignty. And the question is, what does food sovereignty mean? your question is, is directed towards food security. Like how can people have adequate quality calories regardless of their demographic, regardless of where they live? And that goes to the heart of what is the American food story. I think one of the problems with the concept of the American food story is that there is no American food story. Right now, we have a food story that's based on supply chains. You know, we're looking for access to cheap, healthy food, which means things have to be grown. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's the, the remnants of, of my first grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> things have to be grown. Things have to be transported. Things have to be distributed and sold because, I mean, the only way to really get access to clean, healthy food is to grow it yourself. But seeing that 99% of, of, of us in this country don't have the time or the, or the land to do so, we're asking how can the supply chain work for us? And it can't. It's never, ever going to work for us. We have to do the hard work to find our food stories within the supply chain. Food sovereignty means developing or realizing or discovering your own spiritual connection to the foods that make you who you are. Now that, that's deeper than just on a cultural level. 
if you look at human beings, up until about 400, 500 years ago, we weren't terribly nomadic. And those that were nomadic really followed foods. But even for the most persecuted populations, they were you know, village bound for four, five, six, seven, sometimes 10 generations. Now, when you think about just the genetics of human beings, water is pretty much the same around the world. Oxygen is pretty much the same around the world. But the diet that human beings eat is completely varied. Like if you grew up north of the Arctic uh, Circle and your liver couldn't process fat, you would die and you wouldn't pass on your genes. So if you think about us, we are genetically specified for a very, very particular environment where our ancestors or the combination of our ancestors lived for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Now we're all living in totally new areas, totally right. foreign to our genetics. Right, this is, this is my question is, for Native Americans, which we're going to get into very shortly about your film, but you know they're still on the land that many, many, many generations of ancestors were. So their DNA is adapted to the land. But I'm a first, second generation Ukrainian. I'm okay. never going to the Ukraine. So like, so so you you have to you have to go back to the oldest Ukrainians you can find in your family, ask them what was in the pantry of their great grandparents, and you'll get a series of foods. You'll get a series of techniques, whether they're fermentations or preservations, um, and you'll see the food system that your genetics adapted to for tens of hundreds of years, if not millennia. And so, so I'm sorry, but do you think that, because I find that very interesting, and I've heard people say that, that like, um, somebody was telling me I shouldn't take a certain herb because my genetics are from... Siberia, Russia area, or Galicia is actually the area I'm from. But I've been doing microbiome testing. Like, do you think the genetic food sovereignty route is the healthier than like microbiome or there's a combination? Well, r right now, science is looking for a one size fits all approach and giving people, you know, the, testing microbiome, seeing what you're, you're, what you're lacking and figuring out how to plug that gap. Whereas apart from disease or pestilence or, or war, human beings, we can say, lived much more healthy lifestyles pre-industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the prevalence of heart disease, diet-related diseases like diabetes, et cetera, there's an, there's a, an astronomical exponential spike, you know, in the 20th and, and 21st century, as opposed to, you know, 19th and, and, and before. So that said, we have to ask what was different. Our, our foods were different. And those foods had stayed pretty much the same for the hundreds of years pre-industrial revolution, pre-modern food system. So right now we're trying to hack the food system. We're trying to create ways where we can basically find a silver bullet. Whereas the silver bullet is simple. I mean, you can go into the incredible genetic specificity. You can look at biomes, you can look at genomes. Science is so limited in terms of how genomes and biomes and even microbiomes are influenced by foods. But if we go back to our ancestral history, we can determine pretty easily the types of grains, the type of techniques, whether again, fermentation or something else, the types of meats that our ancestors thrived on. We might not be able to have access to all of those grains now, but the variation in the food system has to start working for our genetics rather than creating some sort of homogeneous solution that everybody has to fit into. Right, so for a film director, you know a heck of a lot about food. So why did you tell us a little bit, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself like, how did you get into films? How did you, you have a couple of films focused on food. Tell us about you before we dump, jump more into the food issue. So I, I grew up in an agricultural family in California. My dad was the chief tomato scientist for Del Monte and then oh. Gene, and then they began breeding varieties that a lot of people eat now if they eat Del Cabo brand tomatoes at Whole Foods or the Trader Joe's uh, grape tomatoes. Those all came from his genetics. but. As things go, 
I moved, I tried to move as far away from the, uh, the West Coast as I could uh, without going to Boston, no offense to Bostonians out there. So I ended up in New York City. It was also the home of an Indian spiritual teacher, Sri Chinmoy, whom I, I followed. Um, but I got into human rights and I didn't want the science that my, my dad studied, didn't want the academic rigor that my mom, a math professor at UC Davis followed and began traveling and working on small scale philanthropic and development projects around the world. But in 2011, when I had just started making a series of short human rights films, my dad sent me Barry Estabrook's book, Tomato Land. And love Barry, yeah, I love Barry. Barry's great. And I was shocked to see that the same types of issues, labor related, agriculture related that I was working on overseas, whether in the Caribbean or whether in Central Africa, were very much the norm here in the US. And that's when I began really studying Western food systems from their legacy of land and labor. And that eventually took me to the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, my first feature length film, um, and now my, my third, Gather, which essentially, essentially looks at the obverse of that same coin. Through BLM and through a lot of great awareness raising civil rights movements, we're very aware of the legacy of slavery as it pertains to our economy and to African-Americans. But very few of us realized that that early colonial economy was also based on land. And that land was completely Native American owned or, or stewarded. So you mentioned the tomatoes in your first film, that's food chains. Just tell us a little bit about that. Like, you know, it's about tomato growers, but just tell us a little bit about it. Is it still available? How could somebody watch it if they're interested? It's a really good film. Yeah, Food Chains, I, I, I was really lucky. It, it was a, a, a film about the coalition of Immokalee workers, the CIW, a, a, a very highly regarded um, group of tomato pickers out of central Florida, uh, south central Florida, near Naples, uh, in a town called Immokalee. And they're legendary for transforming the supply chain from the top down, going to the gigantic buyers of tomatoes uh, namely the Walmarts, the McDonald's, et cetera, and getting them to pay a cent more, a penny more per pound of tomatoes they were buying and enforcing a human rights code of conduct. Eric Schlosser, who wrote Fast Food Nation, was an executive producer. Eva Longoria was an executive producer. Uh, Forrest Whitaker narrated the movie. The film's available on iTunes. It's available on Amazon Prime. It's available, I think, on Hulu in, uh, in North America. Um, so yeah, that, that was a great experience. We ended up screening in over 1,100 American cities and see wow. the film impact the highest levels of global supermarket supply chains. So your new film, you've alluded to it and mentioned it a bit, it's called Gather. Um, and thank you for letting me have a sneak peek of it because it's fantastic and I can't wait to watch it again. But do you want to just tell us a little bit about the film and then we're going to show a trailer and then we'll come back and do a deeper dive? Yeah, Gather looks thematically at the Native American food system and the attempted destruction of it by the colonial powers, by the, by the, the British and then, then the U.S. But we should just stay, state off the top that 70% of the global variety of, of diets came from the New World, tomatoes, potatoes, spicy peppers, squashes, a lot of beans, chocolates, avocados, pineapples, the list goes on. Um, at the same time, that movement for native foods was almost destroyed. And in an effort to regain their health and their civil rights and their tribal sovereignty, a number of tribes and Native American food specialists are reviving those traditional food ways. Fantastic, so Brendan, He's, Brendan's our tech person, everyone. Brendan, do you mind showing the trailer? And then we'll come back and then we'll talk more about the film. Our ancestors saw the world end once. That whole life was gone. Now we're on the other side of the apocalypse. The different wrongs that have been done to native peoples are just so sickening. I mean, they even had slogans like, kill the Indian, save the man. That's genocide. 
millions of people all across the Americas systematically wiped out, starting here on the East Coast. That's the reason that we don't have that relationship with some of those traditional foods anymore. What's popping? I see onions. Yeah, we have uh, red onions, yellow onions. Matcha, covered squash. You ready? We're salmon people. Like, what do we do if our salmon don't come back? What I've come to understand is if we want to maintain our culture, then we have to have buffalo as a vital part of our communities. What we're doing is reintroducing our young people to the land, the food, and our traditional ways of healing. Working at the farm has brought a lot of healing to my life. I've been clean 16 years, June now. I learned to heal through harvesting our traditional food. We're celebrating Apache Foodways in a kitchen that was built by Apaches for Apaches. It's this movement among all indigenous people that they're finally, they're listening. And it's like music when you hear the drum, it's calling you. And it's Mother Earth, the Mother Earth heart's beating. And she's talking to all of us that we need to do something. It's inside first like that. Before there was corn, I need to get this. Oh, that's so fantastic. So powerful. So you have a super impressive team of executive producers. You have Jason Momoa, who, if people don't know, that's Aquaman. Um, Jennifer Buffett, she's the daughter-in-law of Warren Buffett. And, and he's the money guy, if you don't know. And Wendy Schmidt, who's the wife of Eric Schmidt. Um, he ran Google and Alphabet. And I hate to I hate to make these people part of somebody else. They are very important people in their own right, but you know, just in case people don't know. So how did you connect with them and what was their interest and how did it all come about? So the, you know, the documentary space is, is tricky in terms of representation, um, particularly when it comes to Native Americans. The very first documentary, Nanook of the North, was kind of a, an exploitative look at Native American traditions in Alaska. Um, so I would never have, pitched myself as a director of a film on this topic. Jennifer Buffett and her husband Peter run the Novo Foundation, and they're actually amongst the, the largest donors to Native American issues. Hmm. I mean, considering the fact that probably the majority of philanthropy comes from family fortunes built on like, land right. related extraction, it's shocking that less than one half of 1% of American philanthropy goes to native led organizations working in Indian country. Um, that Peter and Jennifer have, have worked really, really hard to try to sh shift that percentage upward. So Jennifer actually had the idea of a film on native American food systems, um, a la food chains in a sense. And we began talking and she introduced me to their main food sovereignty grantee, the First Nations Development Institute out of Longmont, Colorado. And we began talking about what a film like this would look like and uh, how important it would be to have a native director. But as we began developing the film and the ideas began to solidify, they actually asked me if I would direct the film myself. And under the agreement that they would drive the indigeneity of it. They would help so, me. Who's the, they? They are the Native American. Yeah. The First Nations Development Institute, a group of Native American nonprofit um, experts in Colorado, that they would they would make sure the film was indigenous in perspective, and I would just use my understanding of storytelling techniques, etc. Just like food chains, we consider our characters in this film the experts. You know, we don't try to to explain them away with professors and other members of the food system. We let these characters drive their own stories. We have a uh, chef from Apache Nation. We've got foragers. We've got fishermen, as you saw in the trailer. So I did a road trip. I love to go out to the Southwest and just get in a car and do Utah, Arizona, New Mexico. Um, and I, have, I ended up on a Hopi reservation once, and they were amazing. And, you know, like many Na Native American tribes, they're very... Um, underserved. But I know that, that uh, some Native American tribes are very cautious about outsiders coming in. How were you, 
how were you welcomed? Was it through the introductions you got? Like, even though you were introduced by someone at a foundation, that's not enough to get them to want you to film. So, so what was it that allowed you to be able to go in and to get into, into such a deep dive? I mean, you got into personal issues and, you know, about, about the realities of Native American, um, in Native American life. I mean, we're just beginning to learn as Western cultures, the depth of colonization, but my family and my teacher Sri Chinmoy came from India, which was under British occupation until 1947. You know, despite people's knowledge of Gandhi and the peaceful uprising, much of the uprising was very, very bloody, right. very violent um, as, it, as it had to be. That said, you know, the British cut and run from the colonies, cut and ran from the colonies in 1776, 1777, and they trained all of their attention onto India. And rather than going by the doctrine of discovery-esque colonization of planting people, destroying people, taking land, they did it through a much more insidious fashion, and that was capitalism. It was completely extractive. It wasn't led by the British government initially, but by the British East India Company. So I was, I was able to really relate, not from a historical trauma perspective, um, but from a colonization perspective. And that was what I discussed with each of my characters, saying, I don't know your culture. I'm never gonna profess to, to knowing that, but you can understand that I'm coming from a similar history where an outside capitalist force attempted and, and was largely successful in destroying spiritual traditions in India. Wow, I didn't realize it was, well, yeah, I guess I did in India. Um, so one of the people interviewed in the film mentioned that food is connected literally to the life of Native Americans. Can you talk a little bit about that and what happened and some of the ways genocide was performed by not actually shooting an Indian, but by attacking their food system? Yeah, you know, interestingly enough, According to anthropologists, agriculture arose around the world pretty much at the same time, with completely separate populations. You know, in Africa, in Asia, and in the New World, um, there's plenty of evidence that shows that that Native Americans have been here for 25,000 years and longer. That said, there were two totally different approaches. Um, farming was very, very similar. You know, Amer Native Americans really focused on the science. They developed corn, they developed a lot of beans, but rather than animal husbandry, um, they focused on wildlife management. They focused very much on foraging, on manicuring areas to lure deer, manicuring areas so that plants would grow successfully that they could harvest you know, in the wild. So food systems were incredibly hyper-localized. There was a bit of trading but for the most part, Native American cultures evolved or developed independently because food was so abundant in specific geographic areas. In California, for example, there were more than 600 linguistic groups. It was the most linguistically wow. diverse place on the planet. That's because of the abundance of California. If you lived on the coast, you could go pull reeds, you could go pull abalone, you could go pull your nets and have an entirely you know, self-sufficient feast within about 20 minutes, quicker than it would take for us to go to Whole Foods and back. So these food systems were highly evolved, highly developed. After a period of treaties and a period of, of wars, and particularly after the Civil War, when the US military was depleted, rather than engaging in battles with Native American tribes to push them off their land physically, the American military began destroying food systems. I mean, they'd always done this. They'd burned fields, they'd destroyed crops. Eventually they realized if they subjugated natives, starved them, made them reliant on army foodstuffs, they could effectively control them. Yeah, the, the, the bit in the film where um, uh, the buffalo, they had the mountain of the buffalo that was shot and the, the, there's a young woman who's researching buffalo and how good it is for you but I, I was just it was just so sad about uh, somebody mentioned that the way they they destroyed the that Indian tribe was that they killed the buffalo because they were so dependent on buffalo I mean there were 63 million buffalo that ranged from the Yukon territory all the way through Mexico 
and in an attempt to, to, to subjugate the most powerfully powerful military tribes in the plains, the U.S. government from, from the Senate, you know, basically developed a policy for tourists on trains passing through to indiscriminately kill buffalo, for traders to go and destroy the buffalo. Um, and they took that population from 63 million down to 23 individuals. But 23? It, yeah, two, three. And they were raised as a tiny little tourist herd in Yellowstone for a number of years before they began uh, loaning them out to breed. That said, the modern food system, the modern industrialized food system came from that. All of the excess fat was used to fill foods in a way that they'd never been able to before. The industrial revolution used buffalo hides and buffalo uh, tendons, for example, as the earliest belts in engines and motors before rubber technology caught up. So those dead buffalo formed a deep part of both the industrialized food system and the industrialized American economy. Wow, wow. So shifting a little to something a little more inspiring and not so depressing, um, the chef and who started Cafe Gaju, Gaju, um, it's a restaurant. It's on the Apache Reservation. Can you just tell us a little bit about it and what I care about because I do road trips and I just need any reason. And I went to a remote area of Utah to eat at Helm's Backbone Grill. Can anyone go? Do I need to make a reservation? Like, can I go if I go out there for a road trip or is it just for people on the reservation? And just sort of give people like a, a background of what it is and what they're doing. So one of the main characters in Gather is a chef named Nephi Craig from the White Mountain Apache Reservation. It's about three hours northeast of Phoenix near uh, a ski resort run by the Apache called Sunrise. Nephi was trained in classical French technique off the reservation and you know, basically led an Anthony Bourdain-esque -like, Anthony Bourdain -esque lifestyle. Um, lots of partying, hedonism, and basically began losing jobs, even though he was a, a highly vaunted sous chef at the time because of addiction and, and issues with sobriety. He ended up having to go back to the only home he could have, which was with his family on the reservation and getting clean. But as he started to get clean, he realized that his relationship with food had always been undeveloped. And he began exploring his relationship with Apache foods, Apache techniques, and began helping others achieve sobriety through cooking. And his dream was to build uh, an indigenous cafe with high concept food at af incredibly affordable prices. And that cafe is featured in the film. It's called Cafe Gojo. Um, they were just about to open when COVID hit and COVID hit the White Mountain Apache Reservation very hard. Um, they've kind of gotten back up and running when we were there filming, they had just begun to train their staff. And right. so now they're, they're back in the, the three, four month cycle of um, getting staff up to, up, up to snuff, uh, teaching the recipes to the chefs. And I would imagine they would be open for service probably in January. And yeah, you could just roll on in. Yay! <laughs> I've needed I've needed an excuse for a road trip to somewhere that is definitely where I'm going and honestly when I went to this this is in Boulder Utah which it's not Boulder Colorado Boulder Utah when I went a lot of people at the restaurant had also taken trips just to eat at this restaurant so I'm hoping that this cafe has the same the same response to it that people see in the movie that although the ingredients might look familiar there is a depth in the way he approaches them just because i mean he cooks with with elk he cooks with squash but his people have been cooking with those ingredients for thousands of years and, and one of the sorry i was just gonna say one of the things i found so amazing the the lovely woman that does the foraging you know she was going out okay everyone has to watch the film to see the was that a rabbit what was something was something was beaten something was foraged live but the the land seems so dead and barren you know they're in the desert and and she's finding this food and i find that so fascinating we really have lost touch with our food yeah i mean 
most places that we visit, even if you went to the Ukraine, where your, your, your family, your ancestors are from, the first things your eyes would recognize wouldn't necessarily be food. When I went with, with Twyla Casador, the forager whom you spoke of from the San Carlos Apache Res, I walked with her through Central Park. I, I thought it's one of the most manicured parks in the world, but she recognized plants there that had a caloric value to human beings. And she found berries that were edible. She found plants that had tubers, that had roots, that had other medicinal qualities. And you realize we're surrounded by food or things that our ancestors would have eaten from, from avian life, birds, to plants, to things under the ground, to medicinal plants. In my front yard in, in Queens, for example, I have mullen plants. They look like weeds, but during the pandemic, you know, I know people were going to health food stores and desperately seeking mullen for its lung clearing properties. And I've got them growing in my front yard, but people walk by and don't recognize those plants. Not right. that I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm an expert myself, but food is always around us. But because we can rely on a corner store or a supermarket, we've lost touch with that right. Right. relationship. I actually would change food. I have a new program. I'm sorry, everybody who watches the show, because I bring it up every show, but it's called Plant Eat Share, because I think that foraging is one of the aspects I'm trying to highlight. There, there is a gentleman, I think it's Wild Man, Steve. He does tours through Central Park and forages, because people don't realize. I see, um, generally tend to be Asian immigrants over in the East River Park, and they know what they, they're harvesting. They're out there foraging, you know, and I'm like, I'm not going to eat dandelion. You know, and people are like, oh, it's great. Um, so one gentleman in the film mentioned that the industrial revolution is over and that we're in a restorative generation. And I just love that. And I totally agree with him, but can you expand on that and just you know, give us your opinion about where we are today with revolutions? Yeah, so that, that quote comes from a young man from the Yurok Reservation on the Klamath River in Northern California named Sammy Jensaw. And the Yurok, as you, that Yurok used that word restorative in terms of their relationship with the land. All of us in the US, if we're not of Native American ancestry, live on someone else's land. Someone's land that was taken from them. Native American land that was stolen from them. And that's not going to change, unfortunately or, or, or fortunately. You know, there is a movement for natives to get access to their land, to get access to stolen land. But where I live in New York City, like there's basically no chance that the native tribe is going to get Queens again. Right, right. That said, as Western Westerners, we've misunderstood natives' role with this continent. Um, we looked at them as occupiers and as people to displace from land. We looked at them as owners we wanted to usurp, but now we realize that they were stewards and that they felt their role was to promote the restoration, the constant restoration and renewal of lands. I think we're finally beginning to realize that the capacity of the earth or the capacity of the earth to tolerate human life is finite and that our relationship can't be extractive anymore. It has to be restorative. Rather than ripping apart the earth for a few things, a few things that we see as precious, we have to learn how to find value in replenishing the earth. What I love so much is because regenerative is the big word we use in the food movement right now. And I hadn't heard the term restorative. And I know they're very similar and they basically have the same meaning. But for some reason, restorative, I don't know, it's, it does have more spiritual ring to it. But we, we, we as non-natives need to use the word regenerative because we've destroyed. Oh, we right. But again, it's like that, that's, that's the wrong framing. It's like when we're always focusing on the extractive value of land and replacing value, there might be a stage where we've replaced it all and then we begin extracting again. Um, or it's like looking at carbon credits. You know, we can extract here, we can regenerate yeah. there and somehow it balances out. Yeah. But if we look at everything with the relationship of being stewards and helping to restore um, what we need from the land for basic human survival, um, 
I think will will ensure a happier, healthier life for our species. Yeah, that young man has a bright future ahead of him. I can see him having a big impact um, on the on not just the food movement, but on movements in general, because you are right, we have to stop the extractive. The industrial revolution is over. I mean, we're killing ourselves. So I saw, I don't know if you saw on the news, you probably did, but they highlighted specifically the Navajo Nation and how COVID had so impacted. The Navajo Nation, um, what I found really interesting is just the fact that they highlighted a Native American tribe and that they were having such difficulties. Uh, the other thing that I found fascinating, not fascinating isn't the right word, but I found impressive was that the Navajo Nation now has COVID under control. So maybe people will listen to what they did. But my question to you is, do you feel that with the, the raising awareness around Black Lives Matter, you know, the movements going on and, and how COVID's been impacting Native Americans has actually been getting a lot of press, that there's finally more attention being paid um, to the wrongs that they've suffered and, and just to their lives in general? I, I, I wish that were true, but as much as I'm appreciative of the articles that the Times has written on various tribes over the, the last few months, the framing is incorrect. They've, Meaning? They've looked at the, the effects of the pandemic as, uh, as a result of congestion as a result of lack of access to water, as a result of lack of access to healthcare, and not as a result of treaties being violated, and not as a result of being stripped of rights to hunt, rights to forage. And people should know, and it was, it was in the trailer, you know, when it became morally reprehensible to slaughter natives, we tried to Christianize them. We ripped them away from their families and we forced them to go to boarding schools to become good Christian Americans. And that separated them from their language. And as soon as they got separated from the language, they lost all the words that described the food around their ancestral land. You know, and we've left them at a state in a state where they're at the end of supply chains because the majority of tribes, not the Navajo and Hopi, the majority don't live on their ancestral land. And they were pushed in the 17, 18 and 1800s as far away from American population centers or railroads as possible. So they're nowhere near supply chains. They get the worst quality food um, and they're in areas that don't have any economic opportunity. You know, tribes are, can't borrow money. Um, individuals on tribes can't borrow money from banks because tribes own the land themselves and people can't finance businesses. Um, there's very little grant money available for Native American entrepreneurs and, and food producers. They've been cut out of the USDA agricultural system to even a greater degree than African Americans have Why? Been. Do you know why? Just yeah, it's racism. Wow. It's always been racism. It's like African Americans couldn't get loans. They couldn't get access to the same set of USDA resources that non non minority farmers could get. And subsequently, generations have have won billion dollar settlements, but that hasn't returned land back to people. So when you look at these communities that have been systemically dismantled and then you see a pandemic rage through and you go like the solution is planting gardens. Eh, I mean, the solution on an individual level is planting gardens. The ultimate solution is to give natives access to the same things, the same resources that the rest of us have access to and to reinvent policy to make it like, like for example like our, our our south dakota lakota character um elsie dubray you can grow buffalo in on lakota land but you can't serve it at schools because it's not a, a usda sanctioned um meat the navajo nation can grow beef but because they don't have a slaughterhouse which is expensive on their nation they can't process the meat on their land and serve it to kids. It has to go off the reservation and then it becomes prohibitively expensive to bring back on the reservation and is instead sold into the American supply chain. So there's a ton of policies that prevent natives from growing their own food, serving their own food. Um, they get subverted by USDA policies everywhere they turn. And if those policies were changed, food systems would be more independent and 
people would have the tools they know can fight pandemics. Lastly, this isn't the first pandemic that Native Americans have faced. I mean, there's a history of deliberately infect infecting them with smallpox, wrapping Native kids in hospitals and small and, and blankets purposely infected with smallpox. There's a really dark history behind all of that. But I think now more than ever, Native tribes are feeling the urgency of accelerating their mm -hmm. sovereignty movement because they can't rely on a system that's always served or is always operated uh, to invisibilize them. So when you say they would have had the tools to be able to deal with COVID, what do you mean? Do you mean they would have healthier food? Like what 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 are you saying there? Yeah, like 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 right now, you know, kids in uh, in in tribal schools um, eat really really junky food, um, and so their 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 palates are are permanently changed. Just the way kids around the world who eat sugar salt fat diets have lost their the kind of the health that that they need to to develop at the same time because generations of native americans were removed from their traditional food systems through boarding schools most tribes have lost the kind of cultural sensitivity um, to food ways but lastly there's an economic disincentive to reestablish those food ways because if you have very little money right now and you've got easy access to cheap, junky food, you're gonna go to that, just like every single impoverished community in America. There can have, you, yeah, go can, you just, can you just quickly just define for someone who might not know, what are you saying when you say food way? Um, just food traditions. Okay. So like if you, if you look at studies that people have done, you know, in the Bronx, for example, just by giving people access to healthy food, it doesn't change their habits. There has to be kind of a deep regenerative program, reestablishing recipes, reestablishing right. importance, and beginning to teach kids from the earliest ages what real food is. Right. It's not hot Cheetos, you know, it's butternut squash soup. But this is where the gardens come in, Sanjay, because you're not into them, but I am. But I think you get a kid to grow his food, he's going to eat it. The, you know, gardens are a good individual solution. Right. But when your kids are at school eight hours a day and the calories they have access to right. are Gatorade and Pepsi and junk hamburgers and none of the food you grow in your garden can ever actually make it in to the place where your kids are spending 40 hours plus a week, you're not going to change the system. When right. there's lots of restaurants around the area and lots of food service that want to be able to cook traditional native recipes with with elk, with wild salmon, with things that aren't hormone-laden industrial beef, they can't do that because those crops aren't certified by health departments. And, or you have to spend a lot of money to get well, that. Well, I was gonna say, they're extreme. You, I think here, I know you could, but it's so expensive. So expensive. Yeah, I mean, I can't afford it and I don't consider myself economically challenged. And so if you, if you look at a restaurant that's not like Chez Panisse-esque, that can literally build a supply chain um, from the top down because they're generating such a high dollar value that like Alice Waters can go out and pay foragers to, you know, right. to deliver, you know, to basically spend all their time, you know, because elk isn't allowed to be served in tribal restaurants, you know, or isn't served in, high, in large quantity, you can't start getting people who might have other day jobs to just become full-time providers. You can't build those supply chains and the, or those traditional systems where that labor is valued within this econ economic system. So do you know, are there people working on trying to get, let's say elk approved by the USDA to be served in restaurants? Like, is there any effort underway? Well, that, like you said, you can do it, but it's, it's so, prohibitive that it requires a tremendous amount of investment. Now, right. You would need a program to just basically tell 10 hobby elk hunters that they need to become elk providers during the entire elk season. And you need to make it advantageous enough for them to quit their, their regular, you know, 365 day a year job to do something that's much more seasonal. Right. You can create those systems, but if you work as an entrepreneur in Indian country, you literally don't have access 
to capital to do that because you don't have collateral. The house that you have, the land that you're on is not owned by you as an individual. So banking systems aren't set up you know, to, to support these sorts of Native American efforts. Now, those are their movements within Indian country to give access to capital, but the amount of capital that I could get as um, a budding entrepreneur in Silicon Valley with just a conceptual idea is in the seven figures and eight figures. You know, Can so I work with you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but, but so, somebody working in food systems in Indian country couldn't even get $10,000. They couldn't even apply to the USDA and, and get that sort of grant money. There aren't many foundations apart from Novo, apart from Christensen Fund, Wendy Schmidt's foundation, the 11th Hour Project, that'll take that risk um, because the rewards aren't scalable. What about Steve Case? Do you know what he's been doing with the bus going around? He's been going around the country in a bus and they do these like hackathons with entrepreneurs, but they're looking for they're like Appalachia and like underserved areas. They, 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 everybody wants the unicorn. Like they want an idea right. they can invest $10,000 right. in that right. will a billion dollar company. Right. And that's the problem with the food system. The best solutions are, are the best because they're never going to scale. You're never right. going to start growing 30,000 acres of some wild sunflower. I can't agree with you more. I was so optimistic when the whole food tech food startup movement happened because it's less than 10 years ago and I've just become more and more disillusioned as it just becomes more and more corporate and industrialized and blah 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 anyway let's not get me depressed or get any of our viewers depressed but so someone's going to watch let's say you know I'm going to go back and I'm going to rewatch the film and I want to do something are there things people can do to support the people in the film or support the Native Americans but right now the, the film is available from today onwards on iTunes Oh, it's available for pre-order right now. Um, so people should watch the movie, but then within their local food system, if you're just a consumer at your farmer's market, try to find the native producers. You know, keep in mind that people from Oaxaca, Chiapas, Guatemala are m more than likely from indigenous communities themselves. They don't speak a European language as their first language. They're very much as indigenous as, as you know, a, a, uh, an Apache or a Navajo. So, you know, start procuring more from them. If there is a local tribe that's serving food, either, you know, at a distribution point, like a farmer's market or has a cafe, seek them out and, and get to understand the traditions of food that were on the land you live on for hundreds of years. If you're a restaurateur or in the food business, you know, begin developing those relationships on a commercial level. You know, for New York City restaurants, there's Mohawk corn, there's coffee from the Shinnecock tribes. Um, begin working with them, begin buying from them and learning more about their food systems. And maybe you'll get access to ingredients that other restaurateurs would die for. Good idea. So is there anything else you'd like to share with us? I, I'm, I'm just happy we're, we're, you know, at this moment, where there's been so much awareness of the kind of colonial vestiges in the American economy. And we can all look and see how we benefited from them. And we know that the change isn't easy to achieve, but it's simple to approach. It's conversations like the one we're having. And it's really being open about the things that unite us. And that's the great thing about food. That's the great thing about right. the food sovereignty movements. You know, we learn more about ourselves. And I, I mean, I've gone back and asked my parents what were in their great grandparents' kitchens in villages in India. And those foods I wouldn't recognize as modern East Indian cuisine. Um, they're so exotic and they seem so incredible that by you know, looking at the Native American food system and the food sovereignty movement and applying those techniques to our own life, I think we can become happier, healthier people too. I agree. And I think happiness is something people don't talk about enough in the food movement that if you were eating well and you were eating what you're supposed to eat it does bring it uh, you just feel better and if you have a relationship with that food you know right i i could go to jean georges restaurant abc i mean every day i couldn't but let's say i did i'd be eating like organic locally grown stuff but would i be as happy as if i cooked myself seven days a week 
Would I be as happy as if I grew that food myself, even if it was nowhere near the quality of taste uh, that he served in his restaurant? I'd probably be more happy. And so right. like I said, it's like the deeper our relationship is with that food, the happier we are. It's not about the quality or where it's from. It's about our relationship. Totally agree. Well, listen, Sanjay, thank you so, so, so much for being part of this. I'm so right. excited great to, 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 to spend time with you even virtually yes yes i mean hopefully we can do this in person one day i didn't realize you were in queens you're just across the river yeah you we, we could meet in the middle i'll meet you on utant island in the east river okay i'll uh, kayak out there <laughs> perfect <laughs> okay so thank you sanjay um and thank you everyone for joining us next week we have bhavani jara from i eat green Again, I am Diane Hatz from Change Food and Sanjay Rawal, oh, Sanjay, I know he's gonna to do it wrong. Rawal, from the film Gather, watch it. Pre-order it on iTunes right now. Thank you. Bye, Sanjay. Bye, Diane.